Hey everyone, excited to be here and you know, giving a bit about what's happening in the world with AI regulation and you know, how we are seeing the world moving towards a more regulated, more compliant environment. Um, you know, I'll give a brief intro, but I also run an AI venture studio out of Austin, and Census is one of the companies we built. We are working on a lot of other companies, so I've been in the space for quite a bit. Um, with that, I'll kind of continue forward with the presentation. Um, so the way we look at it is we'll break down blueprint of US's uh, AI Bill of Rights and its implications. And this is a less developed uh, model as compared to the EU AI Bill of Rights or the EU's AI Act where they actually go a bit more and talk about prescriptive ways to solve problems and how we're going to tackle them. So we'll look at some of the ways that they have highlighted in terms of how we can go towards more you know, compliant or start working towards AI that can be uh, easily understandable and trackable and so forth. And then we'll talk a bit more about kind of how companies are doing it. So the evolution of AI regulations has been the past couple of years. Um, EUs came out kind of last year and you know, just late last year, I think September is when um, you know, US released the AI Bill of Rights. China did it even before EU and Canada has been doing it. And you know, we just see this picking up a lot more considering the events that have been occurring in the last couple of months. Uh, you know, we do feel that usually regulation is always a lot slower in terms of catching up with technologies and at the scale that we are moving, it's kind of really imperative that regulation can catch up, especially for areas that are really impactful to people. Um, so looking under the blueprint for US's AI Bill of Rights, there are five key areas that they are trying to get AI to comply with. So breaking it into them the ensuring safe and effective systems. So what this is saying is that we want to build systems that are understandable. We do risk mitigation before we launch them. And once we launch it, we have a way to monitor them and ensure that they can be safe and effective over time. Second around maintaining data privacy. So the goal here is to ensure that we can have models that preserve or have an option for users to have an agency over the data that is being collected. A bit similar to um, how we did with GDPR and equivalent for California around data privacy, have a reasonable effort to make sure that there's a expectation of data privacy. Seven, having providing algorithmic discrimination protections. So again, this is kind of covering the core fundamental rights of the citizens and how we can prevent algorithmic discrimination for them. Ensuring human alternatives, consideration, and fallbacks. So where we are coming here is to provide a way to have a human alternative to making decisions wherever possible. So this could be something like you know, credit decisions, where if you would like to have an alternative human to look at it, then having or providing an option for an end user to have that. And last, providing a notice and explanation. So surfacing a way for humans to know that this decision or you know, this image or this graphic or whatever was generated using AI and then providing an explanation. So kind of leading to why this decision was made. So people are not kind of left in the dark when they see decisions in terms of why we got to that decision in the first place and providing this transparency. Again, this is what they say it's really hard to take it this into practice because there's also AI assisted decisions, completely AI oriented decisions and how they can be providing notice and explanation is kind of a black box. And kind of we are still in the early days in terms of how this is going to move towards actual implementation. The Bill of Rights itself is non-binding and it's not enforcing any organization to actually act upon it. So while it does say, oh, we have a new Bill of Rights, it's not really being enforced anywhere today. So the next step, and this is what you know, Council of Ch Chambers has been pushing for, is to actually move this and have it start enforcing on organizations. But on the other hand, we are kind of debating between how this stifles innovation and how we can safely move towards a more progressive step. Um, and kind of this is, this is what I was saying in the last few months. This is becoming even more evident, right, with the accessibility that we're now seeing with generative AI and not just AI researchers, but everyday people now have the possibility of creating generated images, right? Uh, I think I saw seeing an image of Pope wearing like a big hoodie and a 
puffer the other day, and you know, these were fake images, but it's really hard to tell, and then now people are making these. <laughs> uh, I think yesterday was an image with Elon Musk dating uh, the CEO of GM, right? Like, at a first glance, it looks, oh wow, you know, he, he's, he found someone new, but uh, it's kind of, <laughs> you gotta take a step back and see, and, and you know, I saw like Twitter started enforcing things, oh, this is like an edge on an image, but a human had to step in and do it, but we don't know how many people got exposed to this image before they were actually able to step in and kind of, you know, put a notice that this was an AI generated content and give the context, but this is because the tweet itself got really popular. But in a lot of use cases where, okay, maybe it's exposed to 10,000 people, right? We may not have someone coming in and looking at it and flagging it. So overall, how do we shift responsibility for these things to people that are distributing it? It's another area that you know, people are pushing for and to ensure that this can be more trackable. I can skip that slide. Um, again, right, there were ethical concerns, right, when Delhi came around, they had to relaunch it due to issues with gender and racial bias. Uh, this is a really popular case of, I believe, Microsoft using an automated resume screening tool a few years ago, where if, we look, if they were hiring for engineering and if they could identify this was a female, then they automatically ranked it lower in terms of evaluation. So this was, kind of they did it for a few months before they kind of, kind of came in and be like, okay, wait, we need to fix this. And you know, this was a propagation of human bias to a certain extent, but then when you don't have that layer and you start taking this technology and scaling it to a lot more people, right, to a large audience, those just get you know, amplified exponentially. So kind of how do we take a step in and understand what biases are occurring and how do we fix them, prevent them, and have a way of actually knowing in the first place what are they? Um, all right. So again, with the AI Bill of Rights, there are kind of three key areas that they're trying to protect for. So A is civil rights, civil liberties, and privacy. So kind of freedom of rights, sorry, freedom of speech, voting, protection from discrimination, and so forth. Making sure these can be attained. Second thing around equal opportunities. So ensuring that this equitable access to education, housing, credit, employment, and other programs. I don't know if you remember when Apple Card first came out with Goldman Sachs, they had this thing where they were not fair in their decision making and they got blasted in the news outlets quite a bit for this and then I think they retroactively went then fixed them and gave credit to people that deserved it and so forth. Uh, so being able to ensure that AI can be used um, in, in an equitable way. The last are trying to access to critical resources or services. So this is you know, the basic needs, healthcare, financial services and so forth. So I think the way we are seeing AI regulation moving and this is where the EU has done a lot more work is to move and identify areas that are high impact, medium impact, and low impact and start regulating in, in that order as opposed to having a blanket regulation towards all technologies because that's going to stifle innovation and slow down progress. But if we can move towards kind of a pyramid where we go and identify the most impactful AI areas and start regulating those first, it would move to a kind of easier solution. Uh, you know, again, EU has some great ideas, so I, you know, I talk about them, but they also have a concept of sandboxing and providing that to developers to work and launch new AI products and work with the government to identify and regulate it as to kind of scale it out. So instead of just not having a way to launch something and go through all the regulatory loops, they have a sandbox where they can have or provide the access of the AI product to a limited population with kind of the government in the loop and then fix it, identify it, regulate it, and then scale it forward. Um, again, I think these are some key challenges in terms of opacity for ML models. These are more traditional models. We can also touch on foundation models and how the challenges with them differ. Uh, obviously, there are a lot more challenges. They tend to be a bit subtle and a bit different, but maybe we'll first go through the challenges for traditional ML models. So we're looking at garbage in model bias, drifts, and traceability. Uh, not saying this is a comprehensive list, but these are some of the areas that we have seen to be pretty effective in kind of the first step towards working on ML models to be more consistent. So kind of data coming in is what data goes out, right? Traditional models where they are kind of uh, specialized and being built for one certain task. The data set has a direct impact on a large proportion to what biases or you know, how the data moves. So if a model is trained on a certain type of data and then the new, either the training data or the new data that we are receiving starts being 
different that can lead to your outcomes being different. And this is how a lot of adversarial attacks happen. So I think in, when Tesla self-driving was kind of in the early days, and not just Tesla for that matter, any self-driving cars, people could trick and have certain signs on the road which would cause the car to panic and you know, accelerate or brake and so forth. So these are kind of the areas where you can have a data being very different and have like an unexpected outcome to what the data input is. And kind of sampling error is again another area that we see a lot of uh, institutions making errors and this is something that is kind of readily uh, solvable. This is kind of a practical way of looking at it. So the data that we are using to train a model needs to be sampled correctly to the data that's actually going to be used in the production environment. So you know, if the distribution of your data is going to be you know, 10, 20, 30% across you know, different cities, right? then you want to ensure that your sampling can be similar. And then the other thing is about having upstream uh, software errors. So a lot of times you can have dependencies on other software pieces, data pipelines, where if there is any kind of change on that front, that can lead to outcomes that are very different for your models. The other way we can look at is model bias and how that carries forward to the end outcomes. Again, sampling bias is thing. There's labeling bias that gets for, put forth because who are the people that are actually training the systems in the first place and what biases that they bring to the table that get carried forward to the end systems. And then obviously like algorithm by human bias and what this leads to is a lot of loss of customer trust, um, you know, negative publicity, right? Where we saw a lot of these news articles about um, companies trying to go back retroactively and fix these systems and you know, in the future, probably some kind of monetary compensations that organizations will have to uh, do for biased models. Other big thing is models are prone to drift. Right, and I'll spend a bit of time here, is the distribution of data shifts over time. Right? A lot of people uh, treat machine learning models as similar to software systems. Right? If we build a web app or a phone app and we launch it, and as long as you know, Apple's not launching a new thing and breaking your app, they kind of keep working. Right? The outcome that you had on day one when you launched it is the outcome that you have you know, day 100, day 1000, day 2000, right? As long as there are no other changes being made. Models behave differently, where models are not the same, where they drift over time. And this occurs due to a lot of reasons, right? This occurs when your behavior of users change. So we look at data drift concept drift. So concept drift is when the actual underlying assumptions and assumptions on how your model is using the data changes. So the great example that, you know, we always use is around COVID and how people's buying patterns changed. And Instacart was behaving people to expect a lot differently than they started during COVID because suddenly you, you had a monumental shift to people ordering online as opposed to going in and buying groceries in person. And this led to their AI models predicting inventory and delivery times to be completely flipped. And the other, the other issue with machine learning models is that it's not like a web app where you get a 404 error, right? So if something's wrong, you gotta fix it. These things are really gradual and your models degrade over time. So you wouldn't see the impact, but maybe it's one quarter from now, two quarters from now, when you actually see customers complaining, or we have you know, quarterly financial results, and we see that this is no longer the way that our models are supposed to be working people can go back and fix it. But it's a gradual decline, right, where it either led to loss of revenue, loss of customers, or one of the other outcomes. What we need to be doing is to track this model drift over time as it occurs. So instead of having a peak that's been declining for a while and then fix it and have a big peak and then decline again, we can have a way so that the models can be kind of fixed over time as and adapt to the changing scenarios. That's for concept drifts. Data drifts, again, is very important because a lot of times the models that we are building, we don't have the ground truths available. And that does not mean that models cannot be tracked in terms of their performance. We can still look at A, the input features and how their distributions are being changed and the outcome and how the distribution for that is being changed, right? So if I have a model that is predicting who to give credits to, like credit as in give a loan to or not, then we can identify the distribution of that 
model and identify if that's changing. So today, if I'm giving loans to 35% you know, that are applying to my loan program, versus tomorrow I suddenly see that 55% you know, are being approved, then that indicates that there's some kind of potential drift in terms of the data that's coming out of it, and that this may be flagged for a human to look at and review further. Um, I think this talks about an example about um, spam emails that were trained in 2020 for IBM and you know, changed in 2022 as like spammers also learn how to trick the systems and not use the same techniques. So having a way to understand the drifts and adapt to that is something that's quite important. And organizations not having traceability in terms of what the models were trained on, when they were trained, explaining them, and so forth. So having a system in place for organizations, uh, however they do it, either they have existing tools, they use some you know, set of docs, but having this traceability in terms of logging when a model is released, who worked on it, what data was used, what expectations were there, and what is happening, so that when an error occurs and we're trying to fix it, we can go back in time, look at it, and fix those items that caused those issues in the first place. Um, other other area, uh, it's kind of not in the slides, but to look at is monitoring your models on a cohort of data. So oftentimes you can be monitoring your model for let's say all of US, right? It's a predictive model for again credit decisions, who to give loans and who not to give loans, and it's for all of the US. Then you know it may be looking good for everyone on the whole. Maybe it's a ninety percent accuracy, good. But then it's possible that for one part one particular cohort of data for, let's say, just the city of Austin, or you know, ages 18 to 24, your model could be behaving very differently. But when it's monitored as an aggregate, those values get averaged out, and we don't see what it could be for that particular cohort of data. So breaking down monitoring and understanding your models is important not just on a global level, but also on a cohort by cohort level. Uh, and I think that's something where our team has done a lot of work in automatically identifying what cohorts kind of are less performant as compared to before and kind of flagging them and you know, promptly monitoring for those cohorts. Framework for assessing AI risk, uh, kind of four areas again derived a bit from the EU's AI Act. AI Act is outlining the goals and objectives for responsible AI, measuring and comparing. So doing a lot of work uh, before the models are launched in terms of risk mitigation, understanding where they fail, what the limitations are across different user segments, then optimizing these models and establishing fairness. Um, fairness is currently being done in just compliant areas, um, like credit, but a lot of areas where fairness could and should be done are not being done today. And then lastly, having a system where we can monitor and build explainable systems. And kind of taking a step further from this and having a way to have a human step in and override the systems, whether that means rolling back to a previous version or moving it to a human-based uh, operations of the system. So either of those two is kind of how we can move towards framework. Um, some strategies to stay on par with evolving AI regulations. And while every country is starting to have their own set of uh, different AI regulations. I was looking today, UK is trying to do their own thing where, oh, we're going to not have one central body to monitor, but we're going to break it down by different impacts of it for a certain category or certain type of regulation. This body's going to do it. If someone else, they're going to do this. So, But on the whole, they're still working on a similar core set of beliefs in terms of how AI should be regulated. So this should be fairly applicable for them. Um, so we look at these data governance, interpretability, human oversight, provision of information, robustness, and documentation. So in terms of data governance, I think we I spoke a bit about it, is to understand and log the model inputs and outputs so that we have traceability to go back and look at it. Ensuring models are running correctly without ground truths. So this is being done with logging as well as doing data drift monitoring. Detecting and flagging data segments with the performance dips below threshold levels. So it's creating systems that are flagging these outcomes as they occur to users and kind of having some kind of real-time alerting for violations depending on 
the impact of the models. Uh, for some of them, it's really impactful to have real time. We also work with organizations where they run their models on a batch basis, where it's happening once a month or you know once every two weeks, where they don't run it on a real time basis. So it's really about how organizations are implementing their data uh, and ML practices. Uh, leading towards AI explainability, and I think the most important area here is to not identify which is the best technique to do AI explainability, because we see this slimes, this shab, this integrated gradients, and so forth, a lot of new technologies coming out. But the core issue that we see here happening is accessibility to people who need to understand and have access to this information at the right time. So whether that's in business analyst that needs to understand why this uh, model predicted an outcome in a certain way, or whether that's uh, an AI engineer who's fixing their models, right? Making this information available to them easily and at the right time is more important. So how can organizations create systems that make this information accessible to them, both on a global level as well as on a local level? So on a prediction by prediction basis as well as on a global cohort basis. So kind of analysis that are helpful are understanding AI explainability on the last two weeks versus this week, and how has my model changed in terms of understanding the information and making predictions, right? You can also do it on a cohort basis where you want to understand how my model is behaving for ages 18 to 24 versus 24 to 30, and then drawing comparisons between the two of them. Because it's possible that there are hidden uh, inaccuracies in your models that you don't realize until they actually start being put out in the real world. So a good example I like to show is if you have an image classification model between dogs and cats, right? You want to be looking at the features of the body to identify if it's a dog or cat, right? Do they have, what kind of skin do they have, right? What's the shape of their body, so forth. But it's possible that if in all of the cat images there was like a Christmas tree behind, and in all the dog images we didn't have a Christmas tree, and the model was just using that to identify and flag it, and it may look good on the training data, but when it's put out in the production environment, it may not be working the same way. So if we have kind of AI explainability, we can double check the assumptions that were used to build these models in the first place. Um, maintaining human oversight. So I think you know, we believe that this is going to move across the different AI regulations with organizations implementing it. So having a way to stop operations if an overseer detects risk, I feel like uh, so this is the, uh, the same words from the EU's um, AI Act, but I think this is derived from more like Terminator and just someone going rogue. Uh, but having a way to have a human come in and overwrite systems is going to be important. Monitoring for anomalies and having uh, this continuous monitoring to make sure that the models are working as expected. A lot of organizations even do automated retrainings where humans are kind of completely away from it, where new data is coming in, they're retraining the model and deploying it again. How can they be confident that the new model versions being deployed are going to be consistent with their original expectations? And lastly, around you know, having explainability so the humans in the picture can identify and step in as needed. Uh, I can skip this slide. So maintaining security and compliance, uh, again, this will go very different based on how AI regulation uh, evolves. Again, what I said earlier, Today's AI rights or bill of rights is all non-binding, not asking anyone to enforce it, just being out there as companies evolve. But as we move towards more uh, regulated environment, one of the key areas is going to be the logging and understanding how the data was moving and who it impacts and who it doesn't impact. So having that traceability is going to be extremely important. Um, goes back to the documentation reporting activities. So for AU, they want people to have experts within each organization that are going to be reportable to the government when it comes to AI regulation. Second thing is having an automated logging capabilities. And lastly, for them, is to have a way to stay on top of model health reports. Um, this is going to be important for the entire business team. Now, as we move towards organization where AI is not limited to one function, but rather the entire organization interfacing it some way or the other. Creating these automated model health reports 
and providing it to the stakeholders is going to be uh, crucial. Um, a ways to look at it is when executives want to see how the AI is impacting their end ROI, right? A, a person that's going to be interfacing with a customer, they need to know why a model made a certain decision so that if a customer has a question or they have concerns, they can be addressed. And then on an AI engineer level, we want to be able to have this monitoring so that and explainably so that we can understand and go back and improve our models for better outcomes. Um, it's a wrap, uh, just some few things, right? So from logging, documenting, reporting, performance analysis, monitoring them, root cause analysis, being able to go very quickly and identifying what went wrong and how we can fix it, having explainability for them, and then troubleshooting and debugging. How can we create systems that are easy to understand and not a black box once we deploy it? Because it's surprising a lot of organizations will deploy these great machine learning models to their production systems, but then have no way of understanding what is happening or have no traceability on that front. Uh, just a quick one slide about us. So we've been building a single platform for delivering enterprise level observability at scale. So for us, that includes everything from training models and so we don't train models, but for us it's monitoring. So identifying and logging of training and test data sets to validating, ingesting that performance, when you deploy recording your traffic and metadata in terms of how your models are working in the real world, then moving to monitoring. So this is performance, drifts, outliers, fairness, automated cohort detection, so forth. Being able to run A-B tests across your different models as we move and deploy them. Analyzing it, so having a BI-like tool for enterprises to understand and slice and dice different predictions and make analysis, and finally, connect this back to your training pipelines to monitor and improve your systems. Uh, but yeah, th that's about us. Thank you.